So here we work through an example of chi-square testing for independence. What do we mean by this? We're having two random variables here, music and weekday. So what's the context? Think about a record store. Uh, the older amongst you may still remember what that is. And um, the record store suspects that on different days, the customers who come in will have different types of tastes. And that may have implications for staffing. Say, if you have someone particularly knowledgeable about metal music, you may want that staff member to be there when a lot of metal fans come in to potentially buy records. Right? So that's why this is an interesting question. And here we have information that come potentially from some survey where that music store has asked customers and they asked them across the week uh, the shops closed on Sundays and they asked their customers what sort of their favorite genre of music is hip hop, rock, metal or pop. Uh, you may of course argue there are more categories but perhaps they are not sold in that store. And what you see here is the observed number of customers. So what we say here that 40 here that means that there were 40 customers on a Monday whose favorite music genre was hip hop. And for instance, there were 90 customers on the Thursday whose favorite genre of music was rock music. So the question is now, are these two variables, music taste and which day of the week customers come in, are they independent? Or are there perhaps days where a certain type of customers comes in more often? So the null hypothesis we are testing here is that W and M are independent and the alternative hypothesis is that W and M are dependent. And if they were dependent then perhaps the store owner has to carefully think about when certain staff members uh, come to make best use of them. All right, so we have these observed um, frequencies. What we now need is, if we want to test a hypothesis, we need a test statistic. This test statistic is often called a chi-squared test statistic. I'll call it actually c-squared, but you could call it chi-squared. And it's calculated as follows. It's, and you should see we're using two subscripts here. Let me explain what they are. EIJ minus OIJ squared divided by O, uh, sorry, not O, but expected IJ. Now, what do we mean with these? Let me just get a different color. OIJ, let me actually draw that in green. These guys are the observed frequencies, and that's what we already have here. Okay, observed. So what we have in this table is the OIJs. IJ, we could say I goes in this case from one, two, three, four, five to six, and J goes from one, two, three, four. We are having four music categories. Okay, that I and J index where we are. So for instance, O two three would be the observed value on a Tuesday for metal, okay? That one here is 023. So that's one element in our test statistic. Now the second element we need in here are these what we call the expected values, ij. Okay, now expected, as always, when we do hypothesis testing, we are making some calculations which assume that the null hypothesis is true. The null hypothesis says that the two random variables are independent, so we will calculate these expected values under the assumption that M and W are independent. So how, how do we do this? Okay, so let's calculate, if we make the independence assumptions, what what does that mean? Well, one way we could think about calculating the number of customers we would expect under independence, and that's assuming that we still have 2,056 customers, 
is we want the probability that a particular customer comes, for instance, on a Tuesday and enjoys metal music most. Well, what we would need is the probability of the weekday being equal to a Tuesday and that the music taste is metal. And if we had that joint probability, we could then multiply that with 2056, which is the total number of customers. Okay, and that would give us an expected, an expected number of customers. In this case, Tuesday was two and metal was three, the expected value for two, three. Now, how do we get this joint probability here? Well, if W and M are independent, then we know that the joint probability is the same as the product of the marginal probabilities. Probability that the day a particular customer comes on a Tuesday times the probability that a particular customer likes metal. Okay, so that's what we, that's how we would calculate the joint probability. And then that we would multiply with, let's call that T, the total, times T. So this one here is T, the total number of customers. So we don't have that probability P, W, that a customer comes on a Tuesday, probability that a random customer enjoys metal, but we do have a lot of observed sample information. So we do know that on Tuesdays, out of our random sample, where's Tuesday here, 236 out of 2056 customers came on a Tuesday. So that was 236 over T, over the total. That would be an estimate of that marginal probability, probability that a random customer comes on Tuesday, given the information which we have. And then times the probability that a um, random customer likes metal, well, out of our 2056 customers, 594 liked metal. So that would be 594 divided by T and then times T. So let's just give these two numbers an, an, a name rather than the actual numbers so we can generalize that. That was 236, that was the observed number of Tuesdays. Okay, let's call that observed two dot. Okay, the observed marginal for Tuesday, which was two, divided by t times, divided by t times t, here 594, what was that? That was the marginal number of observations for metal fans. That was the observed dot three. So it was the third column, the marginal number of observations for the third column. And now you can see uh, there's actually a lot of T's floating around and we can make some cancel out. So we're getting O two dot times O dot three divided by t. That is our expected value for two, three. Or in general, the expected value for i, j, any combination of i and j is going to be o, i dot, so the marginal observations for uh, outcome i, times observation dot j, Okay, that was this one, the marginal observation for the chafed column divided by t. But then we need to calculate that, and I've, of course I forgot this. Okay, I forgot this. We are having, of course, lots of these combinations. So what I forgot here is, or left incomplete if you want to be charitable to myself, 
we need to sum this over all ij combinations. How many combinations do we have here? We have six outcomes here. We have five, oh, sorry, four outcomes here. So that's six times four. We have 24 of these combinations. So it's the sum of 24 terms here. So that's what we need to calculate. Of course, you can see here, we need to calculate this 24 times, and then we need to, um, that was the EIJ, then we need to square the difference, divide by uh, EIJ. That's a lot of messy stuff. We will do this in Excel in a moment, and we can do that very effectively in Excel. Um, and the last thing we need is how this test statistic is distributed, because we can only perform a hypothesis test once we know what the distribution of the test statistic is under the null hypothesis, if the two random variables were indeed independent. Okay, so what we know here is that the distribution of this test statistic, if the null hypothesis is true, is, is a chi-square distribution. Chi-square distribution has a degree of freedom parameter and we need to know the degrees of freedom. In this case, that will be the number of rows minus one. So we call that rows minus one times the number of columns minus one calls minus one. So in this case, that would be five times three, that would be 15. And let me just sketch a chi-square distribution. Okay, so the test statistic C squared under the null hypothesis. A chi-square distribution only lives or doesn't have negative outcomes. Could be zero. And with 15 degrees of freedom, it's possibly going to look something like this. It tends to have a, a pretty long tail here on the right-hand side. And basically, we are now, let's say, we are testing at a 5% significance level. Let's say that was the area which contained 5%. Then we are checking whether our particular test statistic, which we observe, whether that lands in the tail. If it does land in the tail, then we reject H0. If it is not in the tail, then we do not reject. Okay, and we can, of course, calculate our specific test statistic, and we could then calculate a p-value, which we will also do in Excel. And then that, if we compare that p-value to 5%, if it's smaller than 5%, we shall reject. So with this under the belt, let's go to Excel and do the calculations. Recall what we do. We'll start out with this table here. Okay, that's going to be our starting capital in Excel. Then we need to calculate 24 EIJ values. And we're going to use this formula here. And then we need to calculate 24 of these values here. EIJ minus OIJ squared divided by EIJ. And then we need to sum all of these up. And that's our test statistic. So let's get that done. Here is our test, uh, our table, our Excel table. It has exactly the same values. I don't have the marginal values here yet. Uh, we're going to calculate them easily in, uh, in Excel. Uh, let's check 2056 is our number of total observations. So we should get 2056 in a moment. So here's our values. These are the observed values. Let's calculate the uh, totals. Okay, here we will have the sum of these values. And we can copy that across. Here we have the sum of these values. And we copy them across. And then the sum, calculate the sum of all of, all of these values is 2056 as it should be. Now let's actually make that table look a little bit nicer because these values which we just calculated, the, um, the marginal observations here, they're very important because that value here 
is also the what we call the e uh, sorry the o i dots and these are the o dot j values okay recall back these are these values here o i dot and o dot j values these were the values here in the margin of the table and this is just how we calculated them in Excel. So what we now need is the expected value. So how I do that in Excel is I just start out copying the table. So I have the structure of the table and then I take out all of these values. I say I want to calculate the expected values. And now the expected value for this field here will be and we will be using this formula here o i dot times o dot j divided by t so that will be using the formula here it will be that value oh actually i'm sorry i realized i labeled these incorrectly Hang on, let me just do this one here is the o i dot and this one is the o dot j because we said the o dot j's these were the column sums and the o i dot these were the row sums okay so um, i don't need that here anyway so let me take that away so here we go to calculate the expected value of hip-hop lovers come, uh, coming on mondays assuming music and weekday are not uh, dependent on each other it will be O i times O j. Actually, I'll do that in a different way. I'll copy these values across, but I copy them as values. Paste values here. Copy and I paste them as values. So we can work in one table only. So we want the O i dot times the o dot j divided by the total and i will put the total in here i don't have it here yet so so let me put in here 2056 so now we have that so if the two variables were independent we would expect 43 and a half customers approximately it was 40 in the end okay so not that much different so ideally so you could now type this formula 24 times that's a bit tedious ideally i would sort of copy the formula across but you see something doesn't quite work so let me control set for undo this we have to make a little change in our formula to uh, allow us to actually copy the formula so let me double click on this and here's our formula now what I want when you form when you copy formula across actually let's see why it didn't work let's just copy that across here and look at the fields you see as we copied the formula across all the references moved across as well but we didn't want that it was okay for the column sum but not for the row sum because there's nothing so let us delete that let's go back so here's the trick we want that row reference we want that always to stay in column f so therefore we put a dollar in here that reference the b20 as we copy it we always want it to stay in row 20 because that's where our column sums are so we'll put a dollar in front of the 20 and that f20 the total number that shouldn't move at all so we want that to be always in column f and always in row 20 so these dollars they fix that so now that value hasn't changed because we haven't really changed the formula but now we can copy this thing across okay and i uh, lost our nice little boundaries so let's put that back and and this one here so let's look at a random value in here and you can see now we are actually using the right references so if you know that little trick, calculating that table is 
a piece of cake. Let me actually just do that because I messed around a little bit and explained it. And we just do that right from the start again. So you see how straightforward that is. So I delete all of that. So I start by copying this table. Actually, the best thing to do is to paste the values. Okay, so the formula actually disappear. Now take the middle values out. That means we still have our OIs and our Js. Now the expected value, and we should make sure we know that here we're calculating the expected value, and you could the bold and red, so you don't forget about that. The expected value is going to be that value, but here we want to fix the row times that value, but here we want to fix the column divided by the total, and here we want to fix both. Okay, here's our value, and now we can copy that across, and we have all of our values, 24 values, which we need for the expected value. Now, recall, we not only need the expected values, so we have done we have done this calculation now. Now we need to do this calculation. Expected value minus observed squared divided by expected. This is going to be fairly straightforward. So the difficult bit we've done already. I'll do exactly the same again. Copy one of the tables. You could copy whatever you want, whichever you want. And let me paste it uh, here. Let me again paste values. I'll take basically all of the values away. We don't need the marginal values anymore. And now for each of those, let me put a boundary around here. We don't need these marginal values. So for each of these 24 values, we now need to calculate the following equals to expected value minus observed value squared divided by the expected value. So that value 0 0.27296, this is now this value here for i and j both equals to 1. So that is going to be that value for 1, 1, row 1, column 1. Now, of course, we need that for all the different values. Now, actually, let's copy that 1 further on and see whether that has done the right thing. If you look at the formula, actually, that does exactly the right thing. Okay, moving the references was exactly what we wanted here. So that's great. So all we got to do is we got to, we can copy that cell all across here and all down here. We have all the values. <coughs> Going back to our formula, what we now need is the sum of this value across all i and j combinations. So all we want now is we want to calculate the sum of all of these values. So this is our c squared value, 19.3011. Next, we need also the decrease of freedom, all right, decrease of freedom. We calculate that already. That was uh, five, six minus five rows, and four minus times four minus three columns. So that was fifteen. Right? That was five times three. So and now we want to calculate basically the p-value. The way you do that is, or using the chi-squared distribution, chi-squared dot dist. What is the x-value? Well, that's our test statistic. What's the decrease of freedom? That's 15. And do we want the cumulative, the CDF value? Yes. So what we get is 0 0.79959. What's that value mean? Let's go back here. So our C squared value was 19.3011. 
So 19.3011 turns out was perhaps, let me put that here, 19.3. And the probability which we calculated, and just use a different color here, was the size of this area. And the size of this area turned out to be 0 0.7996. Approximately. That means what is the p value of this test statistic? Recall the p value is the probability that if the null hypothesis is true, which here means weekday and music taste are independent, of obtaining a test statistic at least as extreme as the one we got. Extreme meaning a larger test statistic here. Well, that is this probability, the red probability. And that turns out to be 1 minus 0 0.7996, which is 0 0.204, around 20%. We said that perhaps we'll use an alpha of 5%. That means we would not reject the null hypothesis. Do not reject H0. So there is not strong evidence to suggest that W and M are actually dependent on each other. So I hope you realize from that how the principle of a chi-square testing uh, test works and also how to effectively, meaning quickly, calculate this test statistic in Excel.